Good afternoon. My name is R.B. Brenner, and I'm the director of the School of Journalism here at the Moody College of Communication. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to the 2017 Mary Alice Davis Distinguished Lecture in Journalism. This is an annual event that is the highlight of our fall calendar. It uh, is in honor of the memory and legacy of Mary Alice Davis, a pioneering Texas journalist. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Christy Hoppe, the retired bureau chief of the Dallas Morning News here in Austin, and she's going to talk about Mary Alice and why we honor her today. Christy. Hi. I want to say that Mary Alice Davis was a steel magnolia but she was much more Texan than she was Southern, so I don't think that does her perfect justice. She was somewhere in the spectrum of great Texas women between Molly Ivins and Lady Bird Johnson. Lady Bird Johnson, because she loved nature, and she loved hiking, and she loved camping, and she uh, adhered to the Emerson I idea that nature helps us identify who we are in the universe. She uh, was like Molly because she was tenacious and witty and a great writer, and she embraced the progressive ideals of helping the downtrodden and fighting for children and poor and women's rights. She came to the University of Texas as a journalism student in the tumultuous 1960s. Her first job was at the Corpus Christi Caller Times, and there she became the first woman to sit on the copy desk. Now that might not seem like a major crack in the glass ceiling, but I have to tell you that there is no first for women without a good deal of gumption and the tenaciousness to ask the question, why not? In fact, she was the first woman to sit at that copy desk in the 90-year history of that newspaper. <coughs> she eventually moved over to become a reporter, and her writing was so fluid and so crisp that when she wrote about um, a critical story about a philanthropist, the woman called her the very next day and said, my friends tell me I should be really mad at you, but it was so beautifully written that I can't be. <laughs> at the Collar Times is where she married her husband, Jim, and for the next three decades, they would practice journalism and traveling, even living a year in Mexico. They settled in Austin where Jim worked for the Hart Hanks newspapers chain, in the Capitol, and Mary Alice became the editor of the House Research Organization, which succinctly summarizes for lawmakers the pros and bills, of the, uh, the pros and cons of the bills that they're going to vote on that day. And I can tell you on some days, Mary Alice's synopsis is all that divided us from chaos. <laughs> she moved over to the Austin American Statesman as an editorial writer and columnist. A friend recalls that shortly before she started that job, she had a dream that she was a singer and went onto a major stage where she found she had no voice. Well, this proved completely incorrect. She had a major voice, and that voice <coughs> was there, um, was a powerful one. She became an important champion of the Children's Health Insurance Program, and if you know Texas, you know they are loath to buy into federal programs. Well, she became <coughs> an important advocate, and her voice helped ensure the health care of tens of thousands of Texas children. She fought for women's rights and pay equality, for protecting children, and she advocated for the poor. She believed in facts and truth and that words matter, and that if you line them up correctly and well enough, that the readers matter too. They will buy in to what you're saying. That's an important lesson, I think, in today's politics. <clears throat> she worked for the statesman for more than five years, and in that time, she gave voice to the aspirations of millions. When she left the newspaper, <coughs> she went on to form the Texas Women's Coalition and to work on women's issue. And she, intended the, uh, she intend, uh, attended a hell of a lot of lady uh, Texas basketball. Um, Mary Alice died of cervical cancer in 2004. Shortly before she left the newspaper, she wrote a column just before Christmas <coughs> that said, quote, in the vastness of the universe, Humans are so small, eternity mocks the brevity of our days. We are lucky indeed in so many ways. Let us celebrate and share that good fortune. Love others as much as we love ourselves. 
Be kind to all. Pray for peace. Share our wealth. I want to thank the University of Texas Department of Journalism and the family of Mary Alice Davis for helping us share her legacy. Thank you for being here. Before I introduce our speaker, I wanted to acknowledge a few special guests in the audience today. Uh, first, Senator Judith Zaffarini, one of our most distinguished graduates. And this lecture is made possible by the generosity of the Davis family. And we have three representatives today. First, Mary Alice's husband, Jim Davis. Jim, thank you. Their daughter, Rachel. And Jim's wife, Jan Dimitri. All right, now to the main event. So you'll be hearing from John Avlon, and then John and I are going to sit down for a conversation, and we're going to invite you to join that conversation through these microphones that are set up on the aisles. Uh, John is, as you probably know, the editor-in-chief of the Daily Beast, a news and opinion website focused on politics and culture. One of their mottos is, quote, we love confronting bullies, bigots, and hypocrites. And as we all know, there are plenty of those to go around these days. John is also a CNN contributor and the author of several books, including Independent Nation, How Centrists Can Change American Politics, Wing Nuts, How the Lunatic Fringe is Hijacking America, and most recently, Washington's Farewell, The Founding Father's Warning to Future Generations. Uh, in his former life, John was a speechwriter for Rudy Giuliani when he was the mayor of New York City. After the attacks of 9-11, John and his team were responsible for writing the eulogies for all of the firefighters and police officers killed in the destruction of the World Trade Center. It is in my honor to welcome John Avalon to our stage. Thank you, RB. Um, and it's, it's great to be here at, at UT. Uh, I love Austin. Uh, and it's an honor to be here to give the Davis Lecture, following in the footsteps of truly legendary journalists like David Carr, Eugene Robinson, and uh, my former CNN colleague, Candy Crowley. Um, one of the things I love about Austin, and really, I don't think you've got a soul if you don't love Austin, is that this is a place and a city that really is animated by pop culture and politics uh, and drink and food. And these are things that uh, really resonate with me and with us at the Daily Beast, where our big themes are politics and pop culture and power, and we also have a drink and food section that is often inspired by your wares. Um, but what I want to talk to you today about is the mission-driven business of journalism. Why it's more important than ever before? Precisely because it's under attack more than ever before, certainly than any other time in our recent history as a country. And it's not just under attack from the President of the United States, who declares journalists the enemy of the American people and tries to blur the lines between fact and fiction by calling any news he dislikes fake news. Uh, I should just parenthetically say, we're going to use the term, let's define it correctly. Fake news is fundamentally false information written with the intent to deceive. It's not something that makes you uncomfortable because it rubs you the wrong way. Um, but also, I think we need to deal with the fact that journalism is under attack for massive economic shifts in our industry that cannot be ignored and that we have a generational responsibility to uh, confront in a clear-eyed way, consistent with our commitment to quality and respecting our readers' time and intelligence. That's not a given, but that's the right bet to make if we're going to really dive into and accept and embrace the mission-driven business of journalism. But for all the challenges we face, and sometimes they feel surreal like something out of a dark satirical novel, I firmly believe that we will look back on this time as the best time to be a journalist. Not because it was easy, but because it was hard and because our mission was clear. You know, I think sometimes we forget that a mission, a sense of purpose, is perhaps the most valuable thing to a human being. It's what gives structure and texture to our days. It's the internal engine that drives us and make us aspire. And Journalism is not driven on a compensation from financial uh, interests. Let me tell you right now, if you're getting into the news business to make money, you should probably re-examine that assumption. But the real compensation comes from that clear-eyed sense of mission every day, of telling stories, of fighting fights that are about something bigger than yourself. 
And that is invaluable to your heart, your mind, your soul, your city, and your community, and your country. We have the privilege of being a kind of literary private eye. There's a romance to being a journalist, which doesn't extend to all other professions. If you think about the films and TV shows, they tend to concentrate on a really pretty limited number of professions, and journalism is proudly one of them. That's because there is something mission-driven about us, something dramatic, something purposeful, and that's what should motivate us every day. There is an art and a science to the business in this era, and you cannot lose sight of one at the expense of the other. That's an important part of understanding the opportunities of the environment we're in as a business. And finally, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit, I'm going to take you inside the newsroom of the Daily Beast to give you a sense of our culture, about what makes us different, about how we define ourselves as a mission-driven business. But first, I, I want to address the political environment we are operating in and to say that I do not consider uh, the president and his attacks, uh, and they should not be considered as anything remotely normal in American history. Um, there is a natural tension between an administration and the press. Every president has complained about the press he receives. That's normal, that's baked into the cake. Um, but ideally, and I don't think too idealistically, what drives journalists and drives people into public service are two sides of the same coin, or at least they should be. They're rooted in a sense of civic commitment. People ideally go into public service because they care about the country. They want to advance debates. They want to invest, uh, advance ideas. And that's the same thing that should drive people into journalism. So while there's a creative tension, uh, that should not be in contradiction, no matter how many complaints are levied by one side or the other. And uh, as it was mentioned, I began uh, my career not in journalism, but by working in government working in city government. Um, and I think that's probably where I got some of my skepticism about hyperpartisanship as being a, I think, very destructive driver in our society. Uh, a former mayor of New York, Fiora LaGuardia, once said, there's not a Democrat, Republican, or Socialist way to clean the streets. There's a practicality to working in local politics, as well as a deep sense of mission. Um, and, and after working in government at a particularly dramatic time in our city's history, I decided to go into journalism because I felt that there was a deeper continuity. Um, there were opportunities to cash in, I suppose, but the deeper sense of purpose and mission is what drove me. And indeed, there is a history, particularly of speechwriters going into journalism, becoming columnists. There's Bill Sapphire and Peggy Noonan come to mind, although I wouldn't presume to compare myself to them. Um, but what I quickly fell in love with was the craft of American columns in particular. Uh, I ended up uh, co-editing an anthology, two anthologies with two friends of mine, uh, Jesse Angelo and Errol Lewis, uh, called Deadline Artists about America's greatest newspaper columns. And a um, little bit of free advice for any of you who think about writing a book. Uh, the, the right way to think about writing a book is that you should write the book you want to read. And as I was starting out as a columnist, I wanted to read the greatest columns in American history and learn the craft that way, uh, learn about the storytelling techniques um, and what I found was the reported column was a particularly compelling format. And I fell in love with the writing of people like Jimmy Breslin and Murray Kempton and Mike Royko and Texas's Molly Ivins, um, who I'll get back to in a second because we honor her in the Daily Beast newsroom. Um, so this sense of history, the sense of learning a craft, I think is basic to what should animate us. That sense of perspective, imposing perspective on current events, particularly in a contentious time in politics, is one of the important things that we can provide. To offer the reality check to say that, no, this is not normal. Or we have been someplace like this before and it didn't end well. Um, we have an obligation to learn from our history or we will be doomed to repeat it and that's part of our job as journalists and storytellers. I will say that for those who would try to denigrate the role of journalism in our republic, the founding fathers fundamentally understood how essential journalists were, not just to democracy, but to liberty and freedom itself. And I'm, I'm very fond of pointing out that the Constitution doesn't mention political parties, but it does mention journalists. It mentions the press um, in the First Amendment. Not the Second or the Third, the First Amendment. Uh, a sense of the hierarchy of importance at the time. And while, again, we live in a time where journalism is being demonized from the highest corridors of power, I think we can take some comfort from the fact that the Founding Fathers understood our value without flinching. In James Madison's words, and this is in the lobby of the 
uh, uh, Chicago Tribune building, and I love the quote. To the press alone, checkered as it is with abuses, the world is indebted for all the triumphs which have been gained by reason and humanity over error and oppression. Reason and humanity over error and oppression. That is our mission in the deepest sense. We have a commitment to that, and we see evidence of that every day. There are abuses that would never come to light, let alone be punished, if it weren't for the work of great journalists doing their job now, holding power to account. Um, so the Founding Fathers, in whatever contemporary fights we may find ourselves, we can take comfort from the fact that the Founding Fathers were on our side. And efforts to impose libel laws, or threaten to remove licenses, or attacking all critics, their character and names from the bully pulpit of the presidency is outside our best traditions as a country. And that should give us the mission-driven inspiration to straighten our civic backbones as citizens and journalists. That's what should animate us. And however insane the day's news may be, and however exhausted we may feel, we have an obligation to feel invigorated by the challenges we face. That's our opportunity. That's our responsibility. That's the good fight. And if you ever doubt, in a dark moment of self-doubt, the value of journalism as a, not just a profession, but a principled calling, just remember this, democracy depends on it, folks. There is no greater mission than that. Now, I believe news needs to do two things now more than ever, call BS and make important stories interesting. There are all sorts of spin and sprawl and superficiality in our media today, as there always has been. But the value, the transcendent value, if we can find any, is from edgy original reporting pursued without fear or favor. And I emphasize original reporting because that is not a given in our era either. A, quality to commitment, a commitment to quality and differentiation as opposed to content farms, predictable partisan cheerleaders, and commodity news, that is a differentiator in our era that we at the Daily Beast hold dear. I'm a columnist and I love, I love a well-written opinion, but there's no substitute for a scoop in advancing the debate in our society. And the role we journalists need to play in this day-to-day, -day, almost trench warfare we face um, is I think well, well expressed by a senator named Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who said that everyone's entitled to their own opinion, but not their own facts. It's our job to insist on that kind of fact-based debate and move it forward. No matter the incoming we take, no matter the social media mobs that howl for our heads in one form or another, we stay, stand like a rock on that principle with the moral clarity and mission-driven purpose that comes from that statement rooted in the Founding Fathers, then we'll be fine and we'll be better than fine. We will get through this, and we will be better and stronger as a society and as an industry for all we've experienced. But there's another challenge as well, at the risk of uh, glazing over the eyes of some uh, of the younger students, which is the economic environment we operate in. It is a challenge no less real than what we are facing from the current administration. Opportunities abound in the era, this era, but the economic model of journalism is in evolution right now. That may be a polite way of phrasing it. But the simple fact is a free press isn't free. And independent journalism requires financial independence. And it is therefore the job of our generation as well to confront changes in our economic model in a clear-eyed way, recognizing that if we don't find a sustainable model together, there are powerful forces that will drift us into an era of pseudo news at best. All sports and entertainment, delivering desirable demographics without the danger of controversy or the possibility of meaningfully offending anybody, except of course when people at ESPN might criticize the NFL. Um, but that is a form of bread and circuses. And there are uh, corporate citizens who need to step up and realize that this is a time to stand up and support real journalism. That if you want to combat hate news and fake news, which are epidemic online, then there's a commensurate responsibility to support the places that are doing it right. And all the platforms are enormously important, but we are recognizing their limitations. And we cannot depend on any platform or any beneficiary to support quality news. We need to develop an, a, a brand that attracts loyal readers, 
and have businesses straighten their civic backbone as well and support it. Now, the entire business model of journalism can be forgiven for being in chaos because it was largely stable for almost a century. Newspapers were a pretty good business. You had an advertising base and a subscriber base and you owned local markets and things were pretty groovy. Um, that value started to be diminished when news started to be treated as a commodity and local news was hollowed out and communities and towns lost their local paper and it was replaced by wire copy in the name of savings or driving up stock prices. And that created a division, a wedge between local citizens and their local journalists that I think has contributed to the environment we're in. Of course, the big change was the internet, but if anyone's taken by surprise by that now, they haven't been paying attention for 20 years. But it did change the economic models further in positive ways and negative, particularly for newspapers. Um, that was then compounded by the revolution of social media which came really just about a decade after the internet dawned as a meaningful force. And that one-two punch has thrown a lot of news organizations in chaos. Um, we all, as journalists, have a responsibility to, I think, root for each other as well as compete with each other. But we also need to recognize that the time will very shortly come, shortly come where we have a state without a hometown newspaper. That is going to be an invitation to corruption and cynicism. And that, in turn, will make it more difficult to have an educated civic conversation as fellow citizens. That's something we can't afford. George Washington said in his farewell address that self-government depends upon enlightened opinion. That's a big part of our jobs, folks. Um, in any case, social media is the revolution that's transforming news now, and it has given us great opportunities. We have erased the tyranny of distance. That's a wonderful thing for publishers. We have given the ability to communicate with people directly and have a more active conversation with our readers. But, of course, we've also unleashed troll armies, Twitter bots, and interference by foreign powers into our election. Um, we are, I think, currently debating the role of these incredibly powerful platforms. There is good and there is bad. There are well-intentioned people behind them and there's also a degree of willful ignorance. But we are right now doing the right inquest. What I will just say is that none of us, as journalists or editors or publishers, can be entirely dependent upon other platforms for our audience. Renting our readers is almost as bad as buying them which is too often a practice from organizations that are trying to monetize through scale alone, chasing shallow clicks through clickbait in an attempt to get another round of investment. That story doesn't end well. What does end well is a commitment to building a differentiated news brand rooted in quality. And we at the Daily Beast believe that influence matters more than scale for its own sake. That is not to say that growth isn't important. And as Bob Dylan said in an entirely different context, he who is not busy being born is busy dying. Growth is good. We should pursue it. But how you grow is as important as that you grow as a news organization. You need to be focusing on engagement, not just the size of your audience. How many loyal readers are you attracting? Because that speaks to the real value you are bringing to them. I'm incredibly proud that we've more than doubled the size of the Daily Beast since I've been editor-in-chief. We reach them over a million readers a day, and we are a pirate ship of a newsroom, which I will take you into in a second. Um, but I do think that what, measured, what gets measured drives strategy in our industry. It drives the approach of newsrooms, and we all need to be a little bit more thoughtful about not solely looking at scale. We need to look at engagement. You know, if a site has almost four minutes per visit, that's a sign it's delivering real value to its readers. And the, the key equation is that quality news attracts a quality audience. That should be attractive to advertisers, even as we look to diversify our revenue models, as we should. But we should be balancing traffic with engagement and influence, and social shares as a proxy for influence. That's a more holistic way of looking at what we should be valuing, measuring what we value. And if we don't do that, it's going to lead to a lot and is already leading to a lot of incentives that will not help the cause of journalism. Investigative journalism is especially expensive. It is a long read. If people are solely looking on clicks and clickbait, you are going to get even less of it, therefore you will get less accountability for the powerful. And that's a core part of our job. So I think we do need something that resists that drift of simply following algorithms and trending to topics because at that point journalism will become an undifferentiated massive clickbait. And at some point, 
some genius is going to say that journalists themselves are dispensable. And that uh, that clickbait, driven by algorithms and trending topics, can easily and cheaply be done by a robot somewhere. And then all that will be lost is the soul of an organization and the capacity to love. Um, <laughs> I think that's a, a bad trade-off. So we need, need to bet on quality as an organization. We need to move forward the debate about measuring something more than traffic by measuring influence, by measuring engagement, understanding that this is a great time. There are legacy brands that have been caught flat-footed, and I can't help them now. But there are great news brands being built today that if they stay committed to quality, rooted in an understanding that in an age where information is everywhere, commodity news is inherently disposable, but differentiation is the soul of the brand and the reader loyalty that you need to survive and thrive. That's where the great brands will be built. That's where they're being built today. But there are an enormous number of tens and short-term fads that push in the other direction. So we have to stay incredibly clear steering towards that horizon as journalists today if we are going to create something of real value for our readers, for ourselves, for our owners, and for our investors. Now, what I want to do right now is take you inside the Daily Beast newsroom. And I want to show, not just tell, uh, a little bit about how we approach being a mission-driven business. Um, and I've never actually you know, shown these before, so it's a bit of a sneak peek. It's not a state secret. But I think it shows at least how we approach creating a culture at the Daily Beast and, and a culture of differentiation. Um, this is a sort of mashup we use as you walk into our newsroom. And what you see here isn't just the slogan, Scoop Scandals and Secret Worlds. I've got a weakness for alliteration. Um, <laughs> it's a bad quality. Um, but that mix of politics and pop culture and power, um, we do not shy away from world news. We do not shy away from entertainment. We certainly don't shy away from politics. And part of the point of, of what makes us us is a term that gets a little bit disparaged today. And I want, so I want to talk also in defense of intersectional journalism. We need to understand that uh, news doesn't need to take like medicine. And we can reach a young audience uh, if we understand we have an obligation to entertain while we educate. And if I get a young reader who comes in because they want to read a story about Beyonce or Kanye or whoever, and they bump into a story about ISIS or uh, Russia or China's you know, troll farms, um, that is providing a civic service. That's expanding a mind. And I think narrow but intense niche journalism approach may be very good for some models, but I absolutely believe in the power of intersectional journalism because it allows us to make topics that might otherwise be alienating and bring in an entirely different and younger audience. Um, it's kind of a gateway drug approach, but it's what The Daily Show used very effectively back in the day. And, and, and I think there's a real purpose to it. There's a real purpose to it because we need to make sure that rising generations are engaged with the news. And it's one way to do it, and it's a way that I think is entirely editorially defensible. This is some of the art we use, which also is inter, uh, intersectional in its way. This is a, a reference to uh, a Stanley Kubrick film uh, um, with Kim Jong-un. I'm concerned this may prove darkly prescient. When we put it up two years ago, it was not. Um, but again, this is one of the pieces of art in the newsroom. Here's another one, Kanye and Twitter, intersectional uh, art uh, that gives you a sense of, of how the, the art that really just uh, illustrates the newsroom. And we approach it in a gallery format, by the way. We've got one of the greatest art teams in the business. Um, they specialize in photo illustrations, and we change up this art pretty regularly. Um, here's one about Julian Assange and Putin. Um, I think this, uh, this cuts to the heart of some of the issues we're dealing with fairly well. This is our Hall of Fame of journalists, and I'm proud that this is in the newsroom. We were founded by Tina Brown um, uh, nine years ago. Uh, um, and I succeeded her, and, and she is a great spirit uh, who was sort of the founder of the beast. But we've got Christopher Hitchens, Molly Ivins, Texas's own, uh, Tom Wolfe, Joan Diddy, and James Baldwin, Jimmy Breslin, and George Orwell. Um, we will add to this as time goes on, but the reason this is in the newsroom is a reminder that journalism is a craft, and we need to honor the past. We need to take inspiration from the best of the past. And we at The Beast, I think, approach journalism trying to have the voice of a magazine, but the metabolism of a newspaper. Uh, 
and, and it, obviously a, these are outdated terms in some respect, but uh, these big personalities who were not afraid to tell great compelling stories and speak truth to power, they continue to inspire us and that's a reminder that we should be honoring our past and we need to build a great team ourselves and aim for something more than simply the day's work. This is a, a quote that was mentioned. This is in the heart of the newsroom. Uh, we love confronting bullies, bigots, and hypocrites. We need to be happy warriors. News is a business sometimes of heroes and villains. Um, and I should say that the Daily Beast's political approach is nonpartisan but not neutral. What does that mean? We do not assume that either political party has a monopoly on virtue or vice. I think partisan media is a big part of the problem where we are in the country, but we're not gonna pretend there's a mythic moral equivalence on every issue. We're simply gonna commit to punching both sides where appropriate. And I think the theme, the emotional driven uh, focus that really drives a lot of the cultural conflicts in our country is about confronting bullies, bigots, and hypocrites. Um, and that's what motivates us. That's in the newsroom every day. And it helps answer that key question for any journalist in any organization, what's a beast story? All these quotes on the wall help. This is another one that helps that. Michael Hastings, a uh, great young journalist, a late friend of mine. Um, but uh, I love this quote because it also spoke to intersectional journalism and our values at the Beast. There are three great beats in American pol uh, journalism, he said, politics, Hollywood, and war. I think that's true, uh, and he died way too soon. Uh, but I was uh, honored to be able to put something of his up in our newsroom. Now, we're not entirely focused on politics. We are pop culture, and I love this Bruce Springsteen quote. The audience is not bought to you or given to you. It's something you fight for. The point is that this is the Wild West in our industry, folks, and you gotta hustle. You gotta hustle as an individual journalist on social media to break big stories, but you also need to understand that in this environment, if you build it, they may not come. You gotta help find the communities that will be interested in your story. It's a responsibility of editors and reporters as well as the social media team. Hustle matters. And the end result, I think, is hopefully a high metabolism, high morale newsroom. Always skeptical, never cynical. I love this one. I think snark passed for cool in too many newsrooms in earlier iterations of online. I think we have to be motivated by a sense of idealism. Cynicism is a weak excuse for inaction too often. And if it's that predictable a tone, I don't think you're gonna be able to touch people's heart and mind, which is part of what a great story does. So our mission there is simply always skeptical, never cynical. Skepticism is a virtue, cynicism is a vice in our business. And this is the Molly Ivins quote. Keep fighting for freedom and justice, but don't forget to have fun doing it. It's a wonderful reminder that we all need to be happy warriors in our lives in a mission-driven business. That we should take our work seriously and the people whose stories we are telling seriously, but not ourselves. That itself is liberating in, I think, a meaningful way. And that's why when you walk into the newsroom, that's one of the things you see right ahead of you. That's true north. Actually, it is north. Um, I'm not just uh, doing an advertisement for my daughter, Tulalu, whose godfather is here. Um, this is a quote from Ben Bradley, obviously the legendary editor of the Washington Post during Watergate, newly resident, actually being portrayed by Tom Hanks in an upcoming film about the Pentagon Papers. Um, Today our best, tomorrow better. Um, I'm showing you this rather than simply the pillar for two reasons. One, it, it's a reminder that this is a human scale, human sized business. Human beings are inherently flawed. We should aim for excellence every day, but also a spirit of constant improvement. And accept the fact that perfection is an ideal we are never going to reach. Objectivity may be similarly unattainable, but fairness, Fairness is utterly attainable as a value, and that should drive us. A spirit of constant improvement and fairness to all involved. And finally, I think a spirit of generational responsibility. One of the dangers of being an admission-driven business is that um, you can put everything else aside. And I'm blessed with two beautiful children, but my son Jack was three weeks old when I became editor-in-chief of the Daily Beast. And I do think you make all of us make a terrible mistake if we are fighting for larger causes and fighting for the theory of generational responsibility and not keeping in mind the firm foundation that family and love and friends provide. That's gonna make you a healthier, happier human. 
It's going to make you a better journalist and storyteller. It's going to make you a better colleague. And there are a lot of temptations in this business when you're on that mission-driven jag, and there'll be plenty of nights where you work all night, and that's part of the glory of the job. But it can't be at the expense of what truly matters, because that keeps you grounded. That keeps you inspired. So these are the virtues and the values that we put on our walls. They're the alternatives to, I think, the saccharine inspirational posters involving people rowing. Um, but they speak to our deeper ideals as a newsroom. They're a subtle way, perhaps not so subtle, of communicating the kind of culture we are. I think it's differentiated. It's rooted in the past, but aimed at the future. And I'm incredibly proud of the team we've built. Every newsroom, you hear the same refrain. We're always being asked to do more with less. And we are a scrappy pirate ship. But the team we've built, the fact that our, our success to date is rooted in the collection of individuals and the alchemy of those individuals in a creative business. A mission-driven business and a creative business are unlike other businesses. The same metrics don't simply apply. The magic comes from focusing on that mission, from cultivating the creativity, and inspiring those characters to be their best selves day in and day out as we try to fight the good fight for our republic at a difficult time. So thank you very much, and now I'd love to have a broader conversation and take your questions. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so John, I thought we might start with the issue of how the public often views journalists these days. So even among a large- With nothing but reverence, right? Yes. Good, that's what I thought. So I was gonna say, even the large swath of the people who would not accept the enemy of the people label and think mm -hmm. it's ridiculous, you look at almost every survey of people, journalists do not rate high in terms of public trust. Better than congressmen, worse than leprosy. Correct. I think is, um, <laughs> So look, I think you know, th this is something we need to confront and take responsibility for because it's, it's what created the toehold that Trump uh, has tried to exploit, right? I mean, and, and you know, I, I tried to make this point in my talk, but it's nothing short of Orwellian to have someone decry facts he don't, doesn't like as fake news and have that be picked up. I mean, that is, you know, we've had no-nothing movements in our politics in the past, uh, there are good I, I, you know, I've worked for a Republican for seven years. This isn't partisan. It's about uh, the, the morality of what we're seeing in terms of fidelity to facts and truth. But it's because decline in trust in media has been growing for decades. Mm -hmm. And I believe the biggest driver of that is the rise of partisan media. You know, one of the things that's happened from the business side, and this is why you can't ignore the business of media if you're trying to understand our country, our culture, and our industry. We had fragmentation of our media environment. We're not going back to the big three folks. There are plenty of problems in that. Um, Right-wing talk radio started as an attempt to uh, counteract the implicit bias of, what, uh, of mainstream media, by which they largely meant CBS at the time, with explicit bias under the banner of fair and balanced. And then it proliferated from there, uh, where it wasn't just Fox News, but people keep going to harder stuff. You go for narrow but intense niche markets, and you're trying to keep people addicted uh, to anger and anxiety to keep them tuning in. Um, that rise of partisan news is what has made people feel uh, that um, if they someone they disagree with, that you know it, this isn't just opinion. People are coming to debates armed with their own facts. It is undercutting our civic contract because democracy does depend on an assumption of goodwill among fellow citizens. And if you believe the people you disagree with are actively trying to undermine the republic, that's going to be difficult. And if the messengers of that, journalists, uh, are demonized, you start to see the environment we're in now. And, and it is a dangerous environment. It's not just the threats we get. I mean, I've been doxxed more times than I can count in the last couple of years, and the, unfortunately, you know, we get death threats in this business. That's part of it, unfortunately. But um, uh, I really mind when they try to bring my kids into it. Um, but, um, you know, it, it is an ugly environment, um, but we need to take some responsibility for the fact that the decline in trust in media is what has allowed people to exploit this. And I do believe that partisan media uh, shares disproportionate blame. And a related question, and you talked a lot about the, if there are fewer local reporters, you know, people don't encounter journalism or reporters yeah. in their daily life. So being a national organization based in New York, what does the Daily Beast do to try to make sure that you and your staff sort of have a feel for the country and not just talk to the country? Well, <clears throat> look, I mean, you can't be all things to all people. Um, and uh, it's not our job to necessarily 
tell Kansas City's story better than anybody else. And I say that because I actually love Kansas City. Um, Thomas Hart Benton is awesome. Harry Truman's great. And I, I love uh, Kansas City. That said, look, the deeper divides in our country are not red state versus blue state. Uh, they are urban versus rural. Um, uh, and every state has cities and every state has rural areas. I think what, what's, what's been particularly tricky, though, is, is smaller cities uh, that have been gutted over a period of decades. My mother's from Youngstown, Ohio. My grandmother still lives there. They still miraculously have their newspaper, the Youngstown Vindicator, but they're down to only a couple of local reporters. And so what happens is, when elections roll around, reporters come to town and they do stories that have an almost anthropological feel. Mm -hmm. There's a great deal of condescension and people pick up on it. And so all of a sudden, journalism, which should be something that ties us together, is being seen as something other, in from the coasts, condescending to our views and way, to, way of life. And that's why I really do think tying, you know, the, the regional economies that have been created, healing those d economic divides in cities is going to take investment, but local news needs to be part of that investment because it's an enormous part of how we're in the problem we're in. And it's probably going to take a couple of hometown heroes from, you know, from smaller cities and states to, to invest in propping up their local uh, newspaper, their local media, while the industry continues to transition to something more sustainable, which it will. But, but I really think that that distrust of, of journalism is rooted in the fact that a lot of folks don't know journalism and there seems to be an implicit condescension to the way they live uh, too often. Um, you can correct for that if you run a national digital outlet by having a notorious Midwest hiring bias, which I do, <laughs> um, but, but that's not sufficient. I mean, diversity of views, diversity in the newsroom is a way to ha help that and diversity in all senses, by which I also mean regional. But, um, but, but we really need to find ways to invest in and defend local news because there's no substitute for it. We're never going to cover a state capital as well as a local journalist. And citizen journalists may do a great job, but they're just going to be practical limits to what they can do from withstanding lawsuit threats, which are increasingly epidemic in our industry, um, to the kind of just time it takes to break big news if they have another job on the side. The New York Times the other day put out new guidelines about social media use by reporters. My personal view is, is it was an overreaction. I agree with you. Uh, t what's the Daily Beast approach to this? Sure. Um, the Daily Beast approach to social media is, um, that, uh, and I could read it to you, but I'll paraphrase it, um, uh, is that uh, uh, reporter social media accounts are their private opinions, uh, not the official position of the Daily Beast, and we don't police reporters' social media accounts. We want a diversity of opinions, and frankly, you know, part of the contradiction here is that these organizations want reporters who are really active on social media. That can be a double-edged sword. Now, we do recognize, however, that whatever you say or tweet online will be tried in the court of public opinion, no matter what we say, and it can be used against you, your colleagues, or your organization. So I think the bottom line is something as all-encompassing as good judgment. We expect reporters to have good judgment. Um, and, and you know that may be sort of like a you know know it when you see it standard, but we're not going to police individual accounts. We're not going to ask them to not be fully themselves. I think that's inauthentic. It gets in the way of them being their true self and connecting with readers in a meaningful way. And that's part of the conversation we want. I I was very heartened. There was an editor at Huffington Post who, when this um, policy came out, um, tweeted something to the effect of. Or uh, instead of the New York Times policy, they could be more like the Daily Beast, which is to hire reporters from different backgrounds and treat their readers and reporters like adults. Uh, I took that as the highest compliment mm -hmm. from a competitor, mm -hmm. uh, because that is the way we hire. Um, I'll take a quick digression. Yeah. Our, our, our White House team right now is, is, a, is a really dynamic crew of uh, one young reporter who came from Mother Jones uh, and another who came from the Free Beacon, which is a, uh, a you know, so it's a, it's a liberal outlet and a very conservative outlet. Um, but they, work, they, they get along beautifully. They are friends. They have different political perspectives and backgrounds. They are both journalists first. They are hungry to break the story. But that dynamic balance, I think, is unfortunately unlikely to be found someplace else, but really summarizes the Daily Beast and what makes us different. And I think it's an enormous reporting asset to have a team like that. So there's so many students in our audience, and they're probably also wondering sort of what's the path to being qualified for a job with you. And so give us a sense of sort of the range of things you hire for and maybe pick a few that are in most demand and what you kind of look for in the people you hire. Sure. Uh, first thing I'd say, um, and this should be always said more explicitly, I think, when people are in college and grad school, which is that internships are an unbelievable opportunity. 
to get your foot in the door. And you should find the outlets that inspire you and just hustle your way into getting that opportunity. Because in a digital newsroom, you're going to have it's not just it's it's explicitly not getting copies and 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 making coffee. As a matter of fact, we always feel bad about that and end up not asking interns to do it because it's too cliched. Uh, there's going to be research. There's going to be some writing, but it really is just the opportunity. And if you hustle harder and write well and write quickly, um, and are a constructive, positive member of a team and have a specific skill set, um, obviously social media audience development. These are areas that are of growing importance in newsrooms, um, that's, that's, what you, that's the way in, and you should take that opportunity clearly. The other thing is, look, it is, a, it is a challenging time. There are fewer jobs in journalism by many measures, certainly in newspapers. Um, you know, we have a newsroom that is, you know, that is, that is, is multiple smaller than some of our competitors, but we, we're, we're, doing, we're doing fine. Uh, but, you know, so we, we hold those standards high in terms of who we can bring on the team. That said, the democratization of our industry is a massive opportunity, uh, and social media is a great way to do it. Um, you know, I was just talking about social media policy. Well, you know, that's one of the ways I keep an eye on talent. And, and, and one of the things you can do with your social media account is make yourself an expert in a really specific issue. And if you've got voice, and you're the primary curator of news on that subject, and then you're also writing stories on that subject, You've got the ability to be found by editors of national outlets, outlets really quickly. So if you, voice, by which I mean humor and incisiveness, um, and, and really owning an area and issue, you can develop a national reputation, at least among influencers in our industry, very quickly. That doesn't mean we're always going to have a position for your specific uh, passion project, but there are enough emerging issues. I mean, we've been breaking an enormous amount of news um, in the Facebook Russia nexus. Um, you know, we're using hacker journalists, national security reporters, and political reporters. Um, but, I mean, I, I hired one of our young reporters out of college from an internship because she was the editor of her paper at NYU, and she did a great story uh, looking at how One Police Plaza, the NYPD, was uh, um, changing the Wikipedia page of Eric Garner, who had been uh, killed by police uh, in this sort of I can't breathe case and that, uh, that you, she checked the IP addresses of, of the changes in the Wikipedia page and found that it was, you know, it was coming from within the building, one police plaza. That's a skill set that uh, may be native to a lot of younger journalists, but is not to older journalists. And that really made her jump out in my eyes. Um, and then you, once you get an opportunity, it's just that. Then you have to really nail it and work harder than everybody else. Um, but, but there's an enormous opportunity in finding emerging areas of journalism and, or specific niche topics that have real importance, aren't just esoteric for their own sake, and, and owning them. And you can, you can distinguish yourself on a national level in, in very short time, and that's an opportunity that didn't exist 20 years ago. Now, you? How do you think about and, and staff around investigative reporting, both in terms of long-term, mid-term, short-term, sort of how do you align right. your players? You've done this before, haven't you? Yes. Yeah, so <laughs> it, it, it's a, it, it, th there are multiple speeds that are required. I would love to have a spotlight team. That's not gonna happen anytime soon unless anyone in the audience would like to endow it, in which case I'd be delighted to talk <laughs> to you. Um, you know, I, I, I think it is a mistake to judge, uh, I think it's a critical but understandable mistake for people to look at the average cost per content, right? Because you know what that does is it says that you know longer form, deeply reported pieces don't net and therefore shouldn't be done. That is a pressure being felt in every newsroom. That said, what you need to understand is is that you're going to have quick hits that are on the news because speed matters in our industry. You're going to have pieces of analysis and opinion. They are valuable, but I'll say this as a former columnist: opinion is in danger of becoming commoditized. You got to be better to have it matter because the barriers to entry are down and so there's a lot of it. Um, and, uh, and then you're gonna have original reporting, some of which should be really long form. We publish long form yarns, particularly on the weekend. I'm incredibly proud of it. We, you know, one of them you know, did a half million readers the other day. So it's not that people aren't reading it. We had you know, 1.5 million people read a 7,000 word story that it took one of our reporters three weeks to report about a, a death row confession that exonerated two other men on death row. But, but you know, every economic force is, is plotting against that kind of investigative journalism. So it's our job as editors to say, look, you got your passion project, I want you to pursue it, we will make time for you to pursue it. If you need a reporting trip, take it, but I need you to not simply disappear for a month while you do it. Mm -hmm. That's b because if you don't hit the cycle right, it could, it, it could be a tree falling in a forest. 
On the other hand, I had a, a great piece that we turned into a four-parter. It was Confessions of an ISIS Spy, and one of our reporters, Michael Weiss, flew to Istanbul uh, to interview someone who had been one of his fixers on a trip to Syria who joined the Islamic State and then decided he'd made a terrible mistake. This seems fairly obvious but was nonetheless profound. He was one of the first people to get out. Uh, it, it was a very complicated arrangement because of the security implications from a 360 sense. Uh, flew Michael to Istanbul to establish the credibility, the security, got his story, and it was incredibly long, very powerful. Um, uh, we decided we'd break it up into a series and then repackages it as a whole later, right? Um, but, you know, there are times when people's attention is elsewhere. Right now, I mean, the Raqqa just fell, the head of ISIS, and people are not paying adequate attention to that because our attention is elsewhere. It just so happens we held the story a week, and that's when the Paris uh, terror attacks occurred at the Bataclan. And therefore, we popped that in the wake of that, and it, it, it really resonated. So some of it's luck, some of it's skill, but it's also about making the editorial decision that you are going to invest in that. But you have to find a way to make the space for it. You talked, you didn't name Facebook, but you know, certainly sure, in your Facebook. talk. Um, so Sheryl Sandberg, this, I guess this last week, was sort of on this image tour and trying to sort of weakly make the case that they're not a media company. But you, you implicit in what you said earlier was, you know, in the ideal world, you're, you're not so reliant on the platform, but that's the ideal world. A lot of people, that's where they go to try to get their, you know, that's the source of their information. How do you? Yes, I mean, but, but I will say, the point is you can't be overly reliant. You know, the daily, you know, we had a lot of news organizations that made a huge splash, and this is the danger of sort of going for exponential growth. I prefer a value investing approach rooted in quality. You know, um, a, Upwor a site like Upworthy, right, which, uh, really took advantage of Facebook algorithms, sort of gamed the system on headlines. Enormous, I mean, almost you know, explosive growth, near ubiquity to the point, you know, a headline style that was easily and rightly parodied. But then they changed the algorithm. You live by the sword, you die by the sword, you disappear. Mm -hmm. The point is you can't be entirely dependent on someone else's platform. Uh, because, I mean, the thing about the uh, Facebook platform, right, we when I was editor, became editor-in-chief, uh, we had 300,000 Facebook followers. Uh, now we've got 2.2 million. But unlike Twitter, where we've got, I think, 1.2 million, um, is you don't get access to them all at the same time, right? The, the algorithm is, is a little bit capricious and mysterious and may favor video. It may favor people who are paying uh, for traffic. I mean, some of our competitors spend over a million dollars a month trying to buy traffic, particularly right before they're looking for another round of VC cash infusion. Go figure that out. Um, the point is that you know you really are renting your audience, and if it becomes a play-to-play -play relationship, that's not a good relationship. You need to play in social media, you need to play hard, but you can't be unilaterally dependent upon any one platform, because then you will live and die by the sword. You need a diverse revenue pie, and you need a lot of direct. We've had growing direct visitors on our desktop, on our homepage, year over year. We've had growing social, but also SEO. It has to be a really balanced, diversified pie as you look in your referral pie and traffic. And the most important part is direct. It's the people who are seeking you out. It's your return visitors. Because there are a lot of places that, you know, you can poke a hole in their story in a second. You know, they're really an advertising agency pretending to be a news organization. Um, or they're masters of spin because their, their funding model is, is outside capital infusions. Um, and, and that's entirely based on spin and perception, or in many cases. Um, but, but look for your return visitors because if folks are simply buying traffic for people to click on an outbrain module by accident and they stay one second you know you're not really providing any value and that visitor isn't a visitor it's a mistake um, so really focus on growing your loyal readers that and, and and that's what advertisers should be focusing on as well and obviously your loyal readers also can be monetized through membership if they feel inspired to do it because you're offering something of value if it's completely transactional and commodified then it doesn't then they won't so I'm going to ask two more, but in the meantime, I'm going to invite anyone who wants to ask from the audience to line up at either microphone, and I will uh, happily call on you. So let's talk about your role as someone who goes on television and offers commentary insight. Um, for every person like you, there's also people who are just um, borderline irrational, certainly clearly spouting just the same party line all the time. Do you think as someone who loves 
commentary and well-reasoned argument that it just sort of destroys the, the environment in television? Or does it make someone like you stand out more? Well, I, I enjoy the combat with just those type of folks <laughs> enormously. <laughs> I mean, you got to enjoy a good fight. <laughs> and if someone is insulting the intelligence of the audience by sort of, you know, parroting talking points, you have the opportunity in real time to call them out. Do you have a favorite story in that area? Oh, God, there's so many. <laughs> um, no, I, it really is one of my favorite things to do is, is to call out people who are parroting talking points or not answering question or defending the indefensible when they really know it. I mean, Rick Santorum and I had a... Uh, a, a pretty reasonably well-publicized confrontation on that subject when he was uh, excusing Donald Trump's personal excesses. And I, I pointed out that that certainly hadn't been his attitude uh, when Bill Clinton was president and he was cheerleading impeachment. Um, you know, it, but, but I really do think that when, you know, when, when people go up there, and look, I, I think it's, it's sad when people feel that um, they have a role to play and they're getting a paycheck in exchange for paying that role and at some point they abdicate any responsibility or integrity and sometimes you know one of my favorite quotes is, is by Václav Havel which is ideology gives people the illusion of dignity and morals while making it easier to part with them <laughs> those folks at least have ideology in some cases it's just craven teamism and and they have a role to play and it's been assigned and they'll do it dutifully as long as the check the check clears I just think that's somewhere between immoral and amoral. It certainly doesn't add any light. Um, but then I think it's the opportunity to call it out. And I think that's the key. Everyone's entitled to their own opinion, not their own facts. And it's our job as journalists to insist on a fact-based debate and to do it in an engaging way and to enjoy the good fight without fear or favor. So I love those moments. But the danger is that it dumbs it down. The danger is that in, in the attempt to make sure all sides are represented, that you get, you fall into the exact wrong trap of trying to be a nonpartisan news source, which is on the one hand, on the other. And so you create a myth of moral equivalence, where my facts are, are you know, your, your, your lies are just as good as his facts. And, and it's not. And not everything is so black and white. Good people can disagree about policy. But I think it becomes incumbent upon the anchor or the people on air to offer reality checks and facts checks in as, re as close, something close to real time as possible. Uh, that is difficult. I think it's absolutely essential. I think it's good civic sport when it's done right. But if it's done wrong, it, the, the, the effort to be fair, which I think is essential, can itself lead to a dumbing down. Um, so so I, I, that, that really takes a high degree of vigilance um, on, 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 on that side. And, and you know, look, getting people, a lot of our reporters and writers are folks that people see on cable news a lot. I jokingly refer to it as our advertising budget. But it's because I want uh, writers and reporters who have strong presences in these civic debates, who have followers on social media. You want to put a great team on the field. Um, I don't think the gray byline is, is sufficient. The, the work ultimately has to speak for itself. But, but you know, you, you don't, we've got columnists who run the gamut from liberal to libertarian. We, you know, and, and that's really important to me in terms of how we hire. But I'm not going to hire someone who's a talking points troglodyte for, you know, to, to represent all sides. You know, that's the difference between everyone's entitled to their own opinion, not their own facts. That's oh. the right ground to fight on. I'm going to go there. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. This on outstanding okay. lecture and discussion. Thank you. thank you very much. I want to pick up on the two main themes of the business model and mission-driven journalism. And... Um, uh, I'm delighted to see the multiple images and the words of, and, uh, of Molly Ivins. She was a delight, and I miss her. And so, we should all miss at, Molly. At the risk, at the risk of being presumptuous, I want to ask a question that she might ask if she were here, uh, because she sort of asked this question over 15 years ago at one of her last lectures, just three blocks away at Hog Auditorium, and she suggested that, at least for print journalism, that our great colleges and universities assume the responsibility of, of running and publishing or newspapers principally, that they take on as part of their public service mission this, this duty, just as they take on uh, the teaching of the next mm -hmm. generation of journalists as their educational mission. So I want to see if you have any thoughts about that as, as a business model. And on a related topic, the business model used in many Scandinavian countries, which rely on public financing, apparently to 
great satisfaction and effect among the populace. Let me talk about this. I'm going to pass on opining on Scandinavian journalism funding models. <laughs> uh, that's see, next week's lecture. That's, I'm going to have to do a little homework <laughs> on that one for you. Um, I, look, I do think that we, we need to experiment with different models right now. I think the Texas Tribune's model is, uh, has national importance. Um, what it's done is really important. I think grant giving organizations like the Knott Foundation are incredibly important because right now the economics are in flux and I cannot overstate the danger of, of the economic environment we're in because you can see a lot of advertisers say, well, peop more people are reading than ever before, but it's also negative and that's really bad for my brand, so I'm just going to support non-news media. And that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy that's dangerous for democracy. Your point about, or I suppose Molly Ivan's point about whether uh, journalism schools should put out papers, sure, I, I can absolutely see that being, look, it's a, you know, you learn by doing ultimately. You do need to learn your craft and you learn to learn from, from experts. I don't know that um, that would be a business model in upon itself without sort of delving into an NCAA uh, uh, type conversation. But, but I do think that more nonprofit organizations, particularly I think in localities that don't have a local paper, that is a way to do things. We are going to have to innovate different models and try what works. Um, I think print publications are bad business, unfortunately, although I think every state should have at least one. Um, uh, and and I, I root for their success, I genuinely do. But, but I think you know, the Texas Tribune offers a really vibrant model uh, that I think a lot of cities and states can and should learn from. I think a lot of philanthropic organizations need to be looking at supporting quality journalism, investigative journalism. I think ProPublica, as just one example, is doing really important work, partnering with other newsrooms, giving them the flexibility to do investigative work. Um, um, and, and, and I think there's no reason that journalism schools shouldn't be part of that equation. Um, I also say just, you know, corporate citizens should have feel a, 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 a dog in this fight too. You know, it, you know, if, it's, if, if, if the owner of a founder of a business is conservative and wants to support National Review and Weekly Standard, knock yourself out. Um, there's a difference between conservative publication and hate news that plays to the hyper-partisan fringe of division. Um, but, but that should exist particularly for, for local papers as well, that there's an element of civic patriotism that I think businesses and citizens and philanthropies should look at while we explore different models, because democracy does depend on it. And I'll add one other thing. News literacy is really important. And civic education is absolutely critical. Um, and that needs to be, we, we really shouldn't waste our time waiting for you know, local municipalities to find the money to fund civic education. That's gonna be philanthropic efforts, but it's absolutely essential because it's a big part of the problem of why we're here right now. Um, news literacy, decline of local news, hyper-partisan news offering up own facts, and a decline in civic education, which is balkanizing our country. And you are seeing some examples. There's an interesting one in Philadelphia where the Lenfest Institute is basically helping provide support to the Philadelphia newspapers through a nonprofit model that ties in with Temple University School of Journalism and Mass Communication, not to run the newspaper, but to be a player in that. Yeah. Uh, the Knight Foundation is investing in local reporting, but local, and, but also national media literacy. Yeah, and it just it's especially the things that are tougher. To, uh, to, to economically justify in the short run, investigative journalism and local journalism. Yep. It's totally essential. So thank you for your thank question. You. Great. Hi there. Uh, Megan Bradford, second year journalism major. Uh, you mentioned that advertisers need to focus on building a loyal audience. I was going to ask you how my advertisers go about doing that and how can journalists reinforce that? Um, well, I think that where the advertisers should see the value in a loyal audience, right? Um, so that, that, look, building a news brand of value depends on, on brand differentiation. You're doing something different. You have a loyal audience that's coming back to you. And the equation is, if you offer a quality product, you're going to attract a quality audience. They're going to be wealthier. They're going to be more educated. They're going to be more influential. Exactly the type of folks people should be trying to reach or presumably want to reach. It's not going to be all advertisers, but you know, th that is the logic of the case. Um, but I think that means showing in addition to traffic and scale, engagement, loyalty, influence. Measuring those things, because if you measure it, you'll get more of it. And, and that's the real danger. If, if it's simply a clicks-driven business, you are by definition going to incentivize clickbait in the business, and that is going to bleed over into the newsroom, and your content is going to become more commoditized and less unique, and therefore you're going to have a less loyal audience, and it will be less influential, 
and that's gonna end up being a bad thing for the business even though allegedly you did it for business reasons. So I think it's everyone thinking about a, a higher degree of enlightened self-interest, including advertisers. Um, I mean, programmatic ad buys are, are, in, are the lifeblood of hate news and fake news. Um, you know, we interviewed very early on one of the early practitioners of fake news who was a Republican who was anti-Trump. He was trying to create a satirical site to mock how gullible and extreme Trump supporters were in his view. All of a sudden he found that his real true news website uh, that he was doing as sort of like a trolling onion-esque project uh, was making him real money and ended up making like $10,000 a month. Um, and then you've got like towns in Macedonia, you know, pumping out partisan content with a desire to sow the seeds of chaos. Now we know about the Russians. But, but you know, the, the, the flip side of that is quality journalism attracting a quality audience and having the advertisers recognize the value using the right metrics to advance as an industry and then we'll get more of it. That, that is as close to a silver bullet as you're going to get, folks. But it's against a lot of short-term conventional wisdom. The good news is short-term conventional wisdom is almost always wrong. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. I really think you should broaden your spectrum, so I have a modest suggestion for you. <laughs> Someone that you should reach out to since he's out of a job. I'll give you a hint. Um, he said that Donald Trump was the Martin Luther King of health care. <laughs> Jeffrey and Lord. And he said, and he said Sig Heil, so I think he'd be a great... I, I appreciate that. Uh, I, will, I will pass on to Jeffrey your, your, your good wishes. Uh, yeah, you know, yeah, Jeffrey. <laughs> so we have time for two more, and we have two more, so we'll just go here. It's a here. very sweet guy is the thing, but again, you're responsible for what you say when you get the microphone. Real quick, in listening to you, I live in a neighborhood where, you know, two parents work, They've got kids at home, you know, they're up early getting the kids off to school and then they go work all day and then they come home and they're getting through the evening, you know, meals and bath time and all of that sort of stuff. And they're telling me they don't have time. Mm -hmm. They have, you know, they they just... read the news. Read it, watch it, any of it. Mm -hmm. And even my own doctor said to me that he's so worried about what's going on in the world that he finally started watching 30 minutes of news a day on television. My point is that there is so much out there between the internet and the other means of getting it. How do people who don't have any time choose, you know, or how do we get to them? An awful lot of them are just giving up or just telling me they, they just don't have time to figure out what's going on. So <clears throat> th that sort of exhausted apathy is one of the real dangers I think we're facing right now. And it's part of the calculus. I, I don't want to... I don't think we should underestimate the cynicism driving many of the strategies in politics and media today. Part of it is, and this is particularly true with social media mobs and Twitter bots, is to sow seeds of confusion and attack people who take positions to basically make the public square, online or you know, virtual or real, so unhealthy, so unsafe, so toxic that good people with lives retreat. They say, you know what? I don't have enough time or energy for this. I've got real things to do. That seeds the public square to the most extreme voices. And it parallels the polarization, the artificial polarization we see in our politics. The, the answer is ultimately that the ultimate defense in a democracy is we the people. But it requires us standing up and straightening our civic backbones and being active citizens. That requires taking responsibility in politics and news. And, and when news is incredibly you know, depressing or frustrating, it's tempting for people to turn off. But I'm telling you, if you do that, if you do that, you make society dumber by one. Even if you're, a, and especially if you're a good person who's not deeply invested in, a, in, an, in, a, in an intense way in outcomes. Those are exactly the folks we need, people who are uh, independent-minded, who aren't uh, pursuing civic life from a my team versus your team perspective. Those are exactly the people we need. And I can't advise which news source they should read other than, of course, the Daily Beast. Uh, and, and if they're going to choose a cable channel, I strongly support uh, CNN. <laughs> um, but, you know, that has got to be part of your diet as a citizen. It's part of the responsibility. And what's really frustrating is the story you're telling is very common. But it is part of the calculus for folks who are trying to force people out of the civic square so that they can seize more mind share and more power. And, 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 and that is not overstating the strategic element of it. 
So we got to push back on that. Um, we have all a common responsibility to be, have enlightened opinion as citizens, to read the news, to be involved in the lives of our community, to be involved in politics in a way that's constructive, not destructive. Because, you know, there is a moderate majority in this country. Most people do get along and work with people of different opinions every day. And, and that's simply the model that Washington and the political process and our civic discourse needs to follow. Um, but we all need to lead by example a little bit. Last one. Okay, so when I got up here and you said two more questions, I was like, oh no, this is a horrible last question, but piggybacking, maybe it's gonna be hopeful. Um, a lot of threads of what you were saying today really resonated with me in this breaking story with the Washington Post and the 60 Minutes collaboration yeah. on Representative Marino. Feels like it's got potential to bring exhausted people, apathetic people, into seeing the value of investigative journalism and how this, I, I, it's just hard to believe it even happened. So my, my question was just, did you have anything to comment on the collaboration or the, um, the amazing sure. journalism that came out of that? So, so it, that's, a, that's, a great, that's a great question and, and one to end on. For those of you who don't know exactly what she's talking about, so CBS and the Washington, 60 Minutes and the Washington Post collaborated on a really big story, long form investigative journalism and then a, you know, a deep dive on 60 Minutes about um, the opioid crisis, the roots of it, and the way that legislation was being written to basically seed uh, the, these pain clinics and, and pill mills. Um, and, and the phrase that the gone 60 minutes used was drug dealers in lab coats. Uh, and it, it, it's a high degree of collusion with members of Congress, some of whom were trading on those stocks and profiting directly as well as indirectly from these companies, including a person who Trump had nominated to be drug czar, who came from Pennsylvania. Now, he has just withdrawn his name or, you know, jump pushed, you know, we can debate. But I think it's a reminder of, of, of twofold. First of all, that never would have happened if it wasn't for journalism. He would have been drug czar. Tom Price would still be health secretary. You know, there are real demonstrable successes in real times in the last several months alone where journalists doing their job, digging in, not simply, you know, rewriting other people's stories and parroting conventional wisdom, but taking the time to advance the story, held power to account in a way that even a president whose impulse is to denigrate and attack them had to respond to. That's the power of journalism. It's exactly the role that journalism is supposed to play in a free society. And it still works. And the fact that it's a collaboration between two newsrooms is also really heartening because we're going to need to be entrepreneurial like that. You know, CBS is going to do TV better than the Washington Post ever can. Washington Post can have reporting resources and a longer lead time. And Bezos has done a very good job with that, uh, with the paper. I, I really think he has. But those collaborations, look at the Panama Papers. You know, that was also a collaboration between different news organizations. And by the way, you know, we can, we can really confront the, the departure of having a chief executive, a president, attack our industry and to try to blur the lines between fact and freedom. But one of the prime journalists in the, in the Panag uh, Panama Papers was literally blown up in Malta yesterday. So, you know, we talk about press freedom, there's freedom of the press, and then there are countries in the world where journalists are assassinated and targeted. And that is going on uh, on an increasing level as well, often by uh, dictators and author authoritarian, sort of soft authoritarian strong men that too often uh, our, our, our current administration seems to have some degree of admiration for. But we are nowhere near that in this country. Um, but that is an incredibly important story because it digs into a societal problem that's become an epidemic. And we get more information and we see this didn't just happen on its own. There were market forces, there were crooked legislators, there was, um, I mean, literally with these pill mills done at the exit ramps of highways, you know, a town uh, in, in this congressman's district of a thousand people that had a million pills go through it. Um, you know, so it's the virtue of skepticism. It's the imperative of holding power to account. It's the importance of doing original reporting and coming up with new coalitions and co collaborations so we can do our jobs better. But that the job of journalism is more vital, more vibrant than it's ever been because it's a challenging time, because our mission is clear. So that is why now is the best time to be a journalist, and that is a great question to end on. So thank you very much. Great.
Please join me again for thanking John for being so generous with his time and insights. Total honor and pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.